writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the right pack. In this episode of Right Pack Radio, we are going to talk about holding on to hope in the face of constant rejection. And this is as a writer. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Things, president of St. Louis Writers Guild, president of Winding Trails Media, voice actor, writer, and martial arts instructor. Gotta wear a lot of hats. Um, and also, too, coming up soon is Gateway Con. That is a gateway to publishing conference and convention being held by multiple writing organizations in St. Louis. Check it out at www.stlwritersguild.org. This is a writer's conference, a book fair, and a writer's retreat. Again, that's www.stlwritersguild.org. And with me today is the Madame of Murder herself, Fedora Amos. I write Victorian new dunnets like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Right now, I am wading through the copy edited version of Have Your Ticket Punched by Frank James. And I have another six days in order to get it in on time, which I certainly <laughs> plan to do. Also, I am president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime and will be at Gateway Con and doing a panel on... What are you doing a panel on? It's something mystery. Yes, I'm trying to think of the exact wording of it. Let me think here. It's I Love a Mystery Part 2. Uh... The Tricks of Writing Mystery? No, that's not right. But it's something like that, and it'll be fun. I just remember that it wasn't as clever as it could be. Oh, because sure. last time you mentioned it, I'm like, it's not, we love a mystery, <laughs> or you all love a mystery. <laughs> it's a completely different title, but it's I Love a Mystery Part 2. Well, if you love a mystery, murder. you love a mystery. What yeah. can you say? Authors obsessed with murder. Go ahead. <laughs> um, and also with us is our Picasso. You're giving me Picasso now. I'm trying to think of good, good Picasso art. Picasso knew that you must know how to draw to break the rules. Of course. And I hope I break the rules intelligently when I do. My name is Jennifer Solzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I have a picture book out called Dog Park. I have a second one coming out in tribute to my lit dog, Calcifer, who has unfortunately left us. There'll be a big full-page photo in the back of it. Memorializing Calcifer. It's called Cal Learns to Share, and it is a tissue of lies. <laughs> yes. Because he, he, he died still not having known how to learn to share. <laughs> he actually untaught my dog Cowboy how to share, because now he has all the toys and he doesn't play with any of them, because he doesn't think he owns them. <laughs> wow. And also with me is my competition, I mean my wife, my competition. Hi, I'm Melanie Lucas, and... Uh, because of the wonders of recording in the past, we are exactly where we were in the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. well, let me let me explain that. We are doing a double recording today in May because of both Mother's Day and Memorial Day, we do a lot of double recordings. So that way people can actually not hate us mm-hmm. and go out and do things. So yeah, we haven't changed anything. But Didn't get any writing done the yeah. last hour. But my storyboard is done. I just I'm going back through, making sure there's nothing I'm missing. You scribbled it real fast between the two recordings, yes. and that's so. no. that. My beta readers have given it back to me with suggestions. I've added those. <laughs> and with us today is also the Sky Admiral of Steampunk Piracy. So when did he get uh, demoted from being a Commodore? I because he's a pirate. Time. I get to play with him. He didn't play get his yes. thing in. I'm like Kirk. I constantly am getting demoted and promoted. <laughs> it's just a thing. Yes, I am Brad R. Cook. I am the author of the Iron Chronicles, uh, Tales of the Gear Blade, and others. Uh, do check out all the uh, short stories because uh, they're really cool and they're you know quick reads. Uh, also, though, and I want to throw this out there. If you are interested in reading the Iron Chronicles, you can get the Iron Chronicles Trilogy Pack, which is all three books, two prints, gear pin, 
and bookmarks for 36 bucks. Check it out on my website. You can order it there, and I'll even, like, you know, personally grade them all. It's awesome. BradRCook.com. The only thing I will say about Brad with my promotions and demotions, I will not make him into a J.J. Abrams version of Kirk where he went from cadet straight to captain. And with that, sorry, was that a little bit on the nose? Anyway, <laughs> let's talk about the dreaded thing we all hate to receive, and that oh, is geez. rejection. <laughs> yeah, come back as a writer, rejection. Um, I'm not talking about prom dates, I'm not talking about dating in life or anything else. We're strictly talking about writing. It is a fact of life is getting rejected. Either rejected by an editor, rejected by an agent, rejected by a publisher, or even rejected by fans. So, how do you hold on? I mean, we're writing is an introverted activity. We write by ourselves. How do you hang on to hope? Or are, are all writers insane? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Well, that's probably true. However, I will say that there are some re rejections which are actually pretty encouraging. I sent one to Isaac Asimov magazines, and I know you're all going to go, what? <laughs> because you have no idea that I've ever attempted to write let me pause Anything for a second. Totally like Let me fiction. pause her for a second. I've gotten this clue over time that she's into sci-fi. So go ahead. Go for it. Well, I, I, they passed on it, and the editor, whose name I unfortunately have forgotten, <laughs> wrote back to me saying, I'm going to pass on this story, but I do like it and hope you find a good home for it. There you go. So, you know, there are any number of reasons why... Editors will not want your story at that particular time. And they are delish. They get hundreds of thousands. And somehow, yours would have to spark a special interest and be something they've never seen before and want to see before it's going to catch their imagination enough for them to perhaps put you in a separate pile, and then that's going to be going through by somebody else and by somebody else until you have to spark a bit of interest in everybody, and that's just not an easy thing to do. Let me just really quick. <clears throat> you talk about the deluge of submissions I got. There was a great picture I saw. I was in one of the screenwriting groups on Facebook where a person is the... First round, they've got to review all the scripts that are coming into them. So they took a picture, and I just want—I want my—I want our listeners to understand what we mean by deluge. In short stories, it's even higher. Novels, even higher than with probably screenplays. Maybe I don't know. But this person took a picture of the stack in their office of printed screenplays. The stack there were three total stacks, ranging in height. From four to five feet and a half high. Think about it. That's a lot of that's a lot of submissions that they're going through, and they don't have a lot of time. So that's also why they don't always feed. Why people don't give you a lot of feedback. But so anyway. if you get a, a sentence that's halfway nice, no. consider yourself more than fortunate. Brad, I was going to say uh, when I was in uh, acquisitions, so I got a couple of thousand. Uh, uh, submissions a year, uh, you know, and had to go through those. And to be honest, we, we answered as many as we could. We answered most of them. We had a nice form rejection letter that we could, but then you'd always add like one or two things to that form rejection. So it is always nice when you can give, uh, some credibility or some, uh, feedback. But I just wanted to throw out that even me at a tiny little press, uh, was getting a ton of submissions, uh, you know. Exactly. And you don't know what you know what the time frame is. They can how much they have on their desk with those rejections, or what they're looking for. Because yeah. in the case of magazines, they might have thematic issues, mm -hmm. one that's a special issue, and they may have a particular need that they're looking for, and everything else they're going to shove through as fast as they possibly can because they have a a magazine to get out, and they have to be very practical about it. Yes. Um, really quick, and then I'm going over to Jen next. And that is sometimes trends, trends that they're looking for are complete flashes in the pan. They were looking for 
stored novel wise, they were looking for mermaids for a while, mermaid stories, and that died while it was still being talked about and asked for in the in the industry. Go for it, please, Jen. Well, to to take it into a parallel career, uh, I'm an illustrator. I draw pictures for a living. I draw picture books for a living. And one thing that they told me when I attended the SCBWI conference is that uh, if you want to get a big contract with a big publisher, then the 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 reason the strategy to take is persistence. You're supposed to send in. Uh, they use postcards. They still use postcards. I still use postcards. Um, you put your artwork on a postcard and you send it to all these different publishing houses. And if they like you, they'll put you on a board or they'll put you in a file or they'll maybe go look at your website and see what you have. Or maybe they had a bad day and they push all the postcards into the trash that day. Or maybe they look at you and they say, eh, that's nice. And then they throw you or in the trash. Or we've already anyway. got one who does pretty yeah, much what you exactly. do. Exactly. And it's, uh, there was an anecdote told at that conference um, that, you know, you're, he was, uh, he was an acquisitions person working for a big five publishing house. And he had, like, the same day, a picture book manuscript laying on his desk about elephants. And then... A postcard from some unrelated artist landed on his desk that had an elephant on it. He said, okay, sold. And that was what made the decision. It wasn't that the 100,000 people yeah. that had previously sent him a postcard couldn't draw an elephant. It just so happened that that was how the stars aligned that day. If he had come in, uh, if the mail had been a day late, then that person probably wouldn't have gotten that job. And for a lot of writers, it's the same thing. It's, did the... Uh, did the slush pile reader just see a manuscript about werewolves? And so your werewolf manuscript, they're like, ah, let's compare these two. I liked this one a little bit better because of the writing or, or because this character had the name of my ex-boyfriend and I'm glad he died on the first page. Like, whatever. <laughs> um, so we'll pick this one over this one for reasons that aren't, you're a terrible writer. You know, I'm not a terrible artist, but... If, you're a wonderful artist. I'm, I'm a wonderful artist. And you can check me out on <laughs> www.jenniferstolzer.com. It's Stolzer with a Z. But it's, uh, I'm still trying to get that big five publishing gig because it's all about persistence. It's all about confidence. And it's all about not being discouraged when you're not picked. And a little luck never hurts. And a little luck never hurts at all. And let me, I'm going to dovetail in there. And I'm going to start off my dovetail with a quote. As Frederick Nietzsche once wrote, there are many people who are, are I'm going to my paraphrase here, there are many people who are stubborn to the path they choose, but there are less that are stubborn to the goal. Mm-hmm. And what I'm talking about there is a lot of people are, a lot of authors are stuck either in a genre that they maybe not, they don't write well, or they're stuck on one book, and they're determined to get that book published, but, they can, but they're capable of writing other books that can get published. Or it might be something which someone else is write, doing. And they get so focused on this one path of whatever they're doing. That they forget what their goal is. And that's why the goal goes back to why are you writing in the first place? Why, why do you have this dream of being a published author? Even self-pub. Why do, you, why do you want to get that out there? Go ahead, Jen. Oh, maybe we should answer your question by going around the, the room and talking about an episode of our writing career as well, where we faced rejection and what we decided to do leading from that. Uh, I'll start. Okay. My children, my YA fantasy book, Threadcaster, I've been working on it for, uh, I guess it's 13 years old now. Um, when I first started writing it, I had no idea about publishing or anything like that. Uh, It was thanks to the Missouri Writers Guild that I realized that I could, in fact, get published, and I started querying, and my very first rejection came from my very first in-person pitch. She asked for a partial, I sent her a partial, and she said, uh, this is a good start, but you gotta keep going. And it's disappointing to be rejected, but what an encouraging way to start my publishing career. It then went on to get rejected by everyone else. (laughs) 
I rewrote it twice and it continued to get rejected. And eventually I said, well, maybe being my first child, uh, I'm the one who's responsible for getting it out there. If I want it out there, I should do it. And then I self-published it using CreateSpace and have been selling it through Main Street Books and Novel Neighbor and uh, online promotions and this lovely podcast. I mention it every week. And it's, you can, there was the, there was the, there were a lot of opportunities in there where I thought, uh, this thing obviously is not good enough to get published. I should just give up on it. But there were other opportunities to go. Your in-person pitch, your email pitch, perhaps those didn't quite make it through. Think about other places. Online publishing was my place. And we, we live in this new century in which we have... Self-publishing. I mean, it is a way to go. It's a path. All right, anyone else with a story um, of rejection? Go for it. Sure. The first thing that I ever <clears throat> tried to do... See, I had done nonfiction before, mostly because people asked me to do it <laughs> and were willing to pay me to do it. So actually trying to query anybody was an unusual sort of a feeling for me. But when I started in fiction, the first thing that I wrote was a middle-grade book. And I sent it to some publisher, Athenaeum, I think, and got back a fairly encouraging rejection, which said, basically, uh, that I ought to try a female protagonist, okay? And please send it if I do, if I do that. And so I looked it over, and I thought about it, and thought about writing one as a female protagonist, and it just did not come to me. And I said, you know, I don't think I really want to write for middle grades. I think that I want to write the books that I want to read. And those are mysteries. Those are historical mysteries with a sense of humor. That's exactly what I want to read. There aren't nearly enough out there. Why didn't I think of this before? That's what I've got to write. Mm -hmm. And so that is what I have written ever since. So it was kind of an object lesson saying, yeah, you write okay, but I don't want this particular book. And I said, gee, I don't blame her. I don't want it either. (laughs) Brad, do you have one? Uh, yeah, um, but okay, I, I don't want to discourage anyone with this one because this one is sucks. <laughs> um, so it was uh, I had gone to Writers Digest conference uh, up in New York, and they have something called the Pitch Slam, and I pitched to a bunch of agents, and all of them requested, which was awesome, and I came back from that on a huge high. Out of that, uh, one of them actually started talking to me. Uh, we started firing back on email. I did not get the call. It should have been my my first inclination that something was not quite right. I didn't get the call. But I started this email back and forth. And they had read my partial and loved it. But thought it would be better as a middle grade uh, than as a YA, which it is. Um, and this is this is Iron Horseman that I'm pitching. So uh, this is, you know, that book. So it does have a happy ending. <laughs> um, however, uh, she goes, okay, let's turn this into a middle grade. Let's rework the beginning. So rewrite write it as a middle grade. Get it back to me, and I'll see if I'll pick it up. And I was like, this is the best thing ever. Um, so I spent the next uh, basically two, three months completely rewriting the first third of the book. Uh, I decided not to rewrite the whole book because I wasn't certain yet. And she had only asked for the first chunk, the first 50 or something like that. She wanted to see if the new middle grade. And I was like, okay, so I worked my butt off on it. I, you know, change all the characters around. I de-age everybody. I shift the story a bit because it needs to be a middle grade and not a YA. And I turned it back in. And now it's been about six months since the conference and everything's on like riding a high here. And uh, came back with, uh, I'm going to pass on this one. It's a really great thing. You you know, you're a pretty good writer and all that, but it's just not coming together. And, uh, you know, she passed. Every right to. Totally awesome. Uh, but that was that ticked me off. I didn't know what to do. I had a middle grade and a YA uh, that I didn't know what to do with. Um, and I would eventually kind of sit on that for a bit, and I wasn't really certain. And I would end up pitching that then to a small publisher that way. Um, so it did have a kind of a happy ending, but I have to say, out of all the rejections I've ever gotten, 
Uh, that was the one that, that hurt the worst because yeah, I really liked her. I really wanted her to be my agent, and uh, to be honest, it was it was it, it's just that it was not the right book, and it wasn't because it was it's YA, not a bill brain. Mm. Um, and knowing that now, I probably would not say okay to completely rewriting a book like that uh, because I know the stories, I know the way the stories work better. But at the time, it was soul crushing. It took me years to get over. Understood. Um, I know Still Melanie. Over it. <laughs> I know Melanie. You don't have one, or did you? Well, no. But I was just thinking about this, and actually, way back in the day, <laughs> uh, oh, I would have been in high school, maybe even junior high at the time. My mom was trying to get her children's book published. Mm. This was back. Before you could go online and do all these things, so you actually mailed in your manuscript. Uh, by the way, this children's book has never been published, and I can tell you why. She sent it off to five people, got five rejection letters. They were wonderful rejection letters. They gave her concrete advice on how to make changes to the book. She actually got one offer, but I'm not sure in retrospect if that was a vanity press or not. She didn't go with it because she looked at the contract and was like, wait a minute, I'm paying to get this published. Yeah, that's vanity press. Go ahead. Probably, but again, it, yeah, probably. So, uh, point is, it was a book about childhood depression written for children. And, yeah, she couldn't take the rejection. She got very nice rejection letters that clearly all read the book. And uh, she just gave up trying to get it published. And, whew, at some point in time, maybe I'll help her get it published online, independent published. But then, you I'm know, an illustrator you could, you could call. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the issue here is then marketing. <laughs> Speaking of our last author, because, you know, mom isn't really all that great about that either. That would be your job. Yeah. <laughs> Brad, you want to throw something in, then I'll tell my story. Go ahead. Uh, I, this is not a dovetail. This is actually another tale of woe. <laughs> um, I have a lot of them, so we can go on for the rest of the hour about all my tales of woe. Well, I'm going to go with two of them. But go ahead. I wanted to throw these out there. So, um, I have been rejected. Um, more times than I would ever want to count, but I am obsessive, so I have actually counted. <laughs> it's on average about 200 times a book. Um, and I've written several books. Um, and that, that, that is not just agent rejection, that's also publisher rejection and everything like that. Now, some of these rejections are straight off, you know, the, the no whatever rejection, you know, the, the no contact rejection. Some of these are off of submissions where you submit, and a year later you hear back, oh, no, I've decided to pass, and you're like, oh, okay, I thought you already had. <laughs> um, but I just want to throw that out there, that, that, you know, you will face a ton of rejection, and I always look at it this way, because, yes, I've had books that have gone to the point of rejection where I have shelved them and uh, moved on to another book. That's just part of what might happen. Uh, and that's because I'm not self-publishing. I'm not doing them. I, there are other roads I could have walked down with those books and chose not to. Uh, but I was equated to this. And yes, I'm a guy. So uh, I do have a bit of this perspective. But for me, it is entirely like dating in high school. This entire querying process. And the reason I throw this out there is because in high school, uh, you have no idea what you're doing, for one. Uh, two, you ask out girls that maybe you shouldn't ask out and maybe take risks on and stuff like that, and that's smart to do. Uh, and most of the time, you will get rejected. So it's it's just one of those things that, in life, I think it's good to kind of be able to deal with rejection. Um, it's an important skill to, 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 to build up. And as I always say in my pitching workshop, uh, rejection is never about you. It's always about the book. Right. I like high school. <laughs> uh, sorry. I couldn't resist that Very one. Very much like high school. Yeah. Um, my two tales of all that I'm willing to share, they're actually not in chronological order. The first one is later or closer to this date, I should say, than the other one. But I will say I celebrate these two rejections that I'm about to talk about because... Looking at the stories I wrote, I am glad they got rejected. They weren't ready yet. Um, the first one was uh, two stories, two short stories I sent off to a could have been 
either Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine or Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine. I just remember the publisher's letterhead that came back, which, by the way, is the same company. Yes. <laughs> so, so, either one. The first one they sat on for, I might be misremembering this, but call it five or six months. Now I'm sitting here going, thinking at the time, and by the way, when this was submitted, this was done by mail. They still wanted it by mail, by, by email. So I'm like, okay, I haven't heard from them anymore. I'm going to go ahead and send a second one, which technically would have been the same one in a series of short stories that were written about a time period pre-American Revolution set in Williamsburg, Virginia. You aren't the only one doing historical mysteries at times. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I'm picking up the door there. Um... And I got back the same day two rejection letters. Mm. I was like, okay, no comments on it. You know, they were just a normal, thank you for submitting, we wish you for the best, blah, blah, blah. Um, once. I was like, okay. The, before that, I almost had a novel published. And <laughs> I was actually the one who walked away from it. Um, it was a short, it was a science fiction, but what it was, it was, believe it or not, actually at this time wrote Christian science fiction, or at least that's what I was trying for, <laughs> which is, sounds weird to me nowadays. It's um, a genre, though. It definitely is a genre. Yeah, oh yeah, it definitely is a you genre. Publish it. And at least at that time, the um, industry, the market, I should say, not the industry, the market did not believe in aliens. They didn't weigh aliens in their story. They could be humans if they were, they could be genetically altered, but they didn't like aliens. Well, the agent who I had actually pitched to, which was willing to accept it, um, and actually it wasn't an official pitch, it, I, we had lunch together at a conference. But it was the same thing as what Fedora went through. It was like, I, I don't see this working. I can't get the characters to work out right. So after he told me that, I just killed the story eventually because I couldn't change the characters that drastically from what they were. And I'm glad because looking back, um, I, that's the genre I wanted to write in the long term. I'm still working on that part, but hey. <laughs> um, you know. I think I know what genre you want to write in. You just need to get the book out. Oh, the book is in, is, if it's what you're thinking is, the storyboard's done. I just need to sit down and write it. Um, and with that, you, Brad, you said rejection is not about you. What, why should I hold on to hope? <laughs> in face of rejection and rejection and rejection. It's not about us, so, what keep, what, what, why do we keep going? What is it about? J.K. Rowling. <laughs> it's about J.K. Rowling. It's very simple. It's all about J.K. Rowling. No, uh, I mean, the reason I throw that out there is that she was rejected by everybody uh, and ended up with the biggest novel of the 20th century, probably. So uh, it is it is something to keep hope alive. It is something to know that the even if this book tanks, the next book may not. Even if this agent rejects you, the next agent may not. Uh, you know, the, hope is something in this industry that I think every writer has to cling to, because otherwise we will go insane. Right. I'm going to go over here to the door on next, but I'm going to just quickly say real fast, hope is also what gets you in trouble with the vanity presses. That's what they're, that's what they're preying on, is your hope. So just FYI, hang on to hope, but that's also beware of those who suck up to you. And want money from you to publish intent before. I wish I could remember who said this because I think it's a wonderful quotation. A wonderful person is some description, whoever it was, was asked what is the definition of success? And he said, Success is passing from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> like and that. that's what we need as writers. As a Japanese, there's a Japanese saying: "Fall down six times, fall down seven times, stand up eight, or fall down six, stand up seven. Um, I had something relevant. <laughs> <laughs> I threw her on that yeah, one. My no, bad. All of our, such great quotes completely derailed me. Our our question was: uh, How do you how do you how do you maintain your hope? Maintain hope in the face of rejection. Yes. Um, 
I think the question that I was going to take us into was uh, if it's not about you, what is it about? Because a lot of us put a lot of ourselves into our product. Yep. So it's it's for people out there who are mothers, it's people walking up and telling you that your baby's ugly. And the baby's not you. The baby's an independent person, but it still hurts because, like, that's your baby. Uh, the the answer the, to keeping up hope is being aware, I think, that our work, while we put heart into it, and we should, because the heart is what gives it life and soul, uh, remember that we're not perfect and nothing we make is perfect, and we have to keep making new things and practicing to get better. Uh, the, the thing that just got rejected, that might not be... You know, it doesn't mean that it's awful, that it's irredeemable, and you can keep working on it if you want to. But there's nothing like starting a new project and getting excited and enthusiastic about the possibility of that new project and using all you learned from the old project to make that one even better than your last one. And then take that one on the trip around querying. Always be writing a new thing while you're querying your old thing. And that's how you keep your hope up and your enthusiasm up is because you're always, you've got that, it's the joy of creation that made you want to write to start with. And you're still doing it. And you're able to funnel those into the new thing while your old thing is getting punched at. And you keep on working toward your goals mm -hmm. in lots of other ways, too. In networking, in making connections, in learning the craft mm -hmm. by going to things like Gateway Con, for example, and joining writers groups like Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime, for example. <laughs> <laughs> it is working on your craft. It is working on your contacts and working on your content, all of it. And there's nothing more rewarding than any small success you have, so celebrate those. Yes. Along with those lines, um, I'm going... Uh, th this is an episode where David quotes, so I'm quoting. As Robert, Louis Sten As Robert Louis Stevenson once said, do not worry about the harvest that you reap for the day. Think of, it's, I know I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it up in front of me right this minute. Um, don't worry about what your harvest is for the day. Focus on how what you've actually sown, all the seeds that you've sown. If your story has failed, or if your story, like me, I put my story into the burn box, I have the drawer, and I have a burn box. And yes, I do burn the manuscripts. If I put it in the burn box, okay, well, it's gone. It will never, I don't ever want to work on it again, but I've learned from it. There's something that's always improved my techniques, improved my stories. I made them less juvenile, as I like to call it. Um, you don't become a master of your craft first time out. I don't care. There's no such thing as an overnight success, especially in writing. Unless you've got lots of money and you pay somebody to, to that would do it. No, seriously. You've got all these authors out there who are quote-unquote overnight successes that really they went through the grind that you and I are going through all the time. And that leads to a quote, which actually I do have up in front of me, by Michelangelo. And that is, da, 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 I lost it, there it is. <laughs> if people knew how hard I had to work to gain my mastery, it would not seem so wonderful at all. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing. Your hope is built in your work, in, is in each of your projects, in what you do, and what, you, and what your goal is. And why not you want to keep on going after it? You can't let the rejections break you. I mean, if you do that, then... I mean, you... Point blank, you've been given a gift. If, if you have any talent in writing, you've been given a gift. Why surrender it so easily? Just because you've ran over some obstacles. Brad, you're a swordsman, like I am. Is there any sword out there worth its weight in metal that has not been... Slammed into the heat, hammered on the anvil, folded, reheated, refolded, reheated, refolded. Yes, the lightsaber. No, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sarcasm. Thank you. Ah, no. And those don't no, you're exist, very right. actually. You, you are very right with your analogy that uh, everything goes through a process. And it is a long road, usually. Uh, and the reason I say it's a long road because uh, it can take... I mean, most people don't become famous off their first book, even if you've got the contracts and stuff like that. You're still going to build up a readership and, and 
you know, the readership is, is organic and it tends to grow with you as you grow. So, you know, know that. Very good. I was thinking about something Brad said earlier about getting the call. And I think it's a sad thing that they don't call anymore. <laughs> they email you. Yeah. And it's just not the same thing. I got a call when I won the contest for Jack the Ripper in St. Louis. And I was trying to stay calm enough to answer the telephone. I really was. It was a very exciting moment. And I feel bad that, you know, new people coming along don't get that thrill because they're going to get their answer by email. And you'll get a contract and it's great and you go, whoopee! But it's still not the same as getting the call. Well, if you get an agent, they still do call. Do they? So yes. you still have that thing talking one-on-one -on -one with agents. <laughs> okay. uh, publishing houses, they have other stuff to do. Uh, Some will still call you, but yeah, it's, it's not... We did not call. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Brad, uh, Brad's didn't call. And, uh, we did not call. The ones I've spoken to, they all prefer to work in email. And I've gotten to the point as a as an illustrator, I prefer to work in email because I like having it all written down that I can reference. <laughs> you have a record. I have a written record of what people told me that they were going to pay me. That's why I have contracts. Yeah, it's just old Pat for the, that's old pros, you know. Yeah. But that first. I have been in some really strange places when I've gotten those amazing emails. <laughs> yeah, you know, and then you're like dancing around with your phone, and everyone's <laughs> looking at you like, what? For instance, yes. <laughs> come on, Brad, another story. How many of this time? Yeah, where were you? Were you <laughs> yeah, which Denny's were you in? Just you warning to, to just warning to the audience. He has turned two shades of red as soon as we ask this question. So go ahead. Oh no, 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 I don't. I mean, I don't mind. There, there's. Uh, I'm trying to think of the like some of the better ones. Uh, I'd have to probably say one of the the really cool ones was uh, finding out about the science center gate. Oh, um, yeah. Getting asked to do that because um, that was a huge thing, and they were like, "Hey, we want to make you the main feature of the first Friday, uh, which is a thing at our science center here in St. Louis." And I was like, "Are you kidding?" And they're like, "No, and we'd like you to speak in the Omnimax Theater." And all of this is in an email, so it's like, you know, I, I'm I literally just get an email cold, and I'm standing. I was somewhere in public because it was really strange. I'm trying to remember where it was because it was a big place and it was filled with people. So it, it has to be, oh, I can't remember exactly where I was. Uh, but anyway, I, so I get this email and I read through it. And I'm going through all the different, like, things. I don't even think I was in this town. I want to say I want to say I was somewhere else because I was on vacation, I would say. Uh, but uh, so I get this email and I'm literally looking at it. And I'm on high, like, I'm dancing around and having a blast and showing literally everyone who's with me in, you know, this email and kind of going on and on about it. But to the crowd around me, I look like a crazy person who's just dancing up and down. But, you know, obviously once you start pointing to your phone, people stop thinking you're a crazy person. We live in the modern age. But for that instance, you know, you're, everyone's going to kind of look over at you like, what's going on? And, you know, I'm someone who doesn't mind celebrating in public, so I'm going to totally flash this thing around and be like, oh my god, this is awesome. Uh, but so there is that. I, I would say that I've had a few instances where the email that has come in has been super awesome. There's something to be said for getting the news when you're in some other place. I was in Naples, Italy. <laughs> my, my roommate always reads the Post-Dispatch first thing in the morning. So that's what she was doing, and I was doing something or other. And she's like, your book is in the newspaper. And so it was. The cover of my book was in the newspaper. And she went around all day telling people <laughs> about it. And But having her there to do that, was just thrilling. So what are some of the things that keep you hopeful? I, obviously, Brad, you got to present in front of Science Center, which, by the way, there are pictures on my Facebook page of him doing that. Uh, by the way, my personal page, not my author page. And he is standing, staring up at a huge, what, five it's foot? A two, it's a two-story tall version of my airship. <laughs> yeah, two-story tall version two of his airship. Up that's plastered on the wall, and yeah, you, you can barely see Brad. You can barely see yeah, Brad. That, that's actually Jen's illustration, which I loved, and yeah. and to see it almost life size was too cool. Yes, um, and so that's one thing. And Dora, you're just telling me, hey, your book showed up in the newspaper. Yes, that's a real kick. So what are, <laughs> what are some other things? What what keeps you going? What keeps me going yeah. is that I roll out of bed in the morning, and before I'm ever even awake. 
I'm at that computer trying to figure out what happens in the next scene. And oftentimes, I will think about it the night before, and an idea will be there. That's what keeps me going. And right now, I can't, I can't write. I mean, I know the scene that's coming up, but I can't write because I've got to do my edits, yeah. my copy edits. Jen, anything that keeps you going? Uh, I had the great thrill after having published my, uh, my self-published Threadcaster. Uh, I've had the, the excitement of having actual re- fan letters. Like, I never thought that would happen, but local people who picked up my book at a con or who found it in a school library sending me an email from their their middle school email account and telling me how much they loved my book and all the ways that I should change it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, but it's the reason why I decided to self-publish Threadcaster instead of, uh, instead of pursuing a different publishing route for it was I just really wanted to share something with other people. You know, i have been loving it and sitting on it for so long that I wanted to share it with people and let it go off and get its own legs. So having feedback on it from people I've never met before, uh, it fulfilled that dream for me. It was knowing that someone gave it to someone else. Uh, I have one anecdote. Um, someone said that, you know, I haven't read your book yet, but that's because I loaned it to my son and my son loaned it to his friend, and his friend loaned it to his sister, so I don't know when I'm ever going to get it back. And it's like, that's okay. I'm glad that those three people have read it. Would you like another copy? <laughs> and that's that's what keeps me going, is those little little tiny rewards and reminding me the reason why I decided to do it in the first place, which was to share my stories with people and to feel like I'm contributing to people's imagination. When someone comes back, and even if they just say, I have a favorite character, like that's really all I need. Is knowing that someone identified with it enough to be like, I I like the way this person did this thing. I want to be more like that. Brad and then Fedora. Um, so I would throw out that for for me, it's always been the small things. Uh, I do a lot of book signings and events like that where I'm in front of my readers. I guess you would say it's my number one way of getting readers, and. Um, now having had multiple books, uh, the three books of the series, I am blessed to have had people who read all three <laughs> and who came to each, uh, each year to my book event. I had the blessing also of having my, my release date on the very same day every year for the three years of that book. So, uh, that was really great. So people kind of, they, they knew it was on their calendar almost and it, it just became a thing. Um. And when I had them show up and be like, you know, he's really excited to read the third one, and you've got a 10-year-old kid sitting there in front of you, or a 12-year-old kid standing there in front of you, who's super excited not only to meet you, this amazing author that they've read your book, and, you know, and then all, you know, and then having that person come back the next year, and be super excited to read the next one, and then having them come back the third year, that is... Uh, that will always be gold to me. In fact, if I achieve nothing else in writing, uh, I, I have that experience, and that is awesome. Um, I would also throw out that the first person ever to do a book report on my book <laughs> was the craziest thing in the world to me. I mean, I remember doing book reports like crazy in school, and the fact that somebody did my book uh, is it, just the coolest thing in the world. And then the last one I'm going to throw out is to a teacher friend of mine, who texted me one day and said, this is the coolest thing. One of my students just walked in with your book. Hmm. And that was the coolest thing in the world. Like those little things to me are infinitely cooler than almost anything else I've achieved where, you know, I love having conversations with my books where I'll sit down with my readers and we'll talk about everything. And yeah, I don't even mind when they tell me that what they wish would have happened. Like somebody was like, your third book was kind of long. And I was like, well, it was, the, it was a wrap up, you know, this guy, kind of like, it's just, I don't mind at all. I love having conversations about my books, but it's the little things like that, the interactions with my readers that I think I'll always cherish. Sure. I would think it would be a good thing for everybody, published or not, to seek out little bits of joy. How to do that? I think one great way is to find a critique group and share with them your words, and they share theirs, and they'll find things that they believe you could do better, and that's great. 
but also they'll give you compliments and fi- and you can find out the things that they like and it's just a little bit of reward a little bit of uplifting on a regular basis i recommend it to everyone mm-hmm. get a a nice critique group one that is compadre filled and <laughs> you have fun and you laugh and it's wonderful right I completely agree, and just to throw out the little things, so I recently just hit the first or the last period on a, on a, a manuscript that I'm writing. Uh, I've been working on it all year, and it's it's one of my passion projects. Congrats. And uh, yes, and just that. So I know that it's just the first draft. I mean, there is so much work left to do on this book, but it doesn't matter to me because I hit the final period for the first time. And that is a huge accomplishment. And I celebrated. I even posted it up and everybody liked it on Facebook and, you know, told me that was great. It was a big congratulatory thing. So I am a huge believer in celebrate your little victories. Anything else from anybody else? And a little victory can be just finishing a chapter. Just internally, when you write, you know when you've done something well. You know if you've written a good line. You know if the chapter is satisfying to you. And if no one, the, if you don't have a critique group or you don't have readers yet, uh, sometimes you got to make your own reward. Uh, when I was writing Threadcaster, if I met my goal, you know, my goal was I was going to finish this portion of the draft by Easter. And if I did that, I bought myself a cupcake. Exactly. And so and I, I kept that up. Every time it's like, oh, I finished my draft. Time to go get my congratulatory cupcake. And that made me smile. Even though I get a cupcake any day in my life that I wanted to because I'm an adult with my own money, uh, it's because, oh, I get to reward myself with that. It's something that made me smile that I enjoy. And I take a photo of it and post it. It's my congratulatory cupcake. It may or may not have an action figure in the picture. The uh, it just, you got to make your own fun sometimes. Exactly. And I'm going to say this. Having watched her, a couple of times, go get that cupcake. <laughs> you, I have, I it's, I haven't seen that many children grin so wide, <laughs> except for when they are in, stuck inside of a candy candy store. She, biggest grin ever. Light face lights up. It's worth watching. Time for celebratory cupcakes. Yes, absolutely. When I write the end at the end of a novel, I give myself a shot at Quantro, and I don't care. It's five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Hey, I have said many times on this show that I'm a fan of uh, ancient scotch, and uh, I, I reserve the best scotch for when I finish my books and stuff, because obviously it's the most expensive. I'm going to drink that stuff the slowest. So. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Savor that for those good book moments. But yeah, no, it, it's it's very much about celebrating the, the little moments and, and you know, knowing how to, and, and you have to, because otherwise you'll go insane. Yes. <laughs> And I guess on that note, I'm going to say have a great week writing. Tune in next week for yet another interesting adventure in the writing industry. Keep writing out there. Never, never give up. Take care. Bye-bye. The new theme songs for Write Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers.